This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. We turn now to the U.S.-Mexico border, where a reporter obtained a recording of immigrant parents who have been separated from their children. The audio is from a mass trial of dozens of immigrants in a courtroom in Brownsville, Texas. Standing shoulder to shoulder, men and women in shackles plead guilty to the crime of illegal entry during a mass trial. If you listen closely, you can hear the clinking of their chains as federal magistrate judge Ronald Morgan asks a man if he would like to say anything before he is sentenced. Anything else you wish to say again before sentence? Mm -hmm. Okay, no. Uh, Mr. Hernandez, anything you want to say before sentence? Sí, eh, también sobre mi hijo, yo lo traigo conmigo. Aquí me lo separaron. Y... Also, I was bringing my child with me, and I guess never they got separated. We got separated. Okay. And I just told uh, Mr. Hernandez Lopez, my understanding of the way it's supposed to work is because you're from a country other than Mexico, you're going to be sent to a camp, and you're going to be sent to a camp where your child will be allowed to join you. That's my understanding of how it's supposed to work. Do you understand that? Sí. How old is your child? Six years. Six years. Eh, me preocupa, me preocupa bastante porque, no sé, me duele saber que me lo van a dejar aquí y a mí me van a mandar o... I'm very worried because uh, they're leaving here and then I'm going to get deported. Well, you're supposed to be joined with the child before you are deported. And if Mr. Hernandez Lopez will just tell you, the theory is that's going to keep you from coming to this country. That audio of federal magistrate judge Ronald Morgan's courtroom in Brownsville, Texas, is from a report for The Intercept by D uh, Debbie Nathan, headlined, Hidden Horrors of Zero Tolerance, Mass Trials and Children Taken from Their Parents. The story also features a rare photograph from inside a federal courthouse in Pecos, Texas, that shows dozens of immigrants in orange jumpsuits spread across a courtroom and fi filling up a jury box as they are all tried at once. Mass trials for crossing the border, scattered cases of family separations have taken place since Operation Streamline was first introduced in 2005. But last month, Attorney General Jeff Sessions announced the federal government will now prosecute, quote, 100 percent of illegal southwest border crossings. I have put in place a zero-tolerance policy for illegal entry uh, on our southwest border. If you cross the border unlawfully, then we will prosecute you. It's that simple. If you smuggle illegal aliens across our border, then we will prosecute you. If you are smuggling a child, then we will prosecute you. And that child may be separated from you as required by law. Well, for more on this new policy, how it's unfolding, we go to Austin, Texas, where we're joined by Debbie Nathan, independent journalist, usually based in Brownsville, Texas, on the Mexico border. Her new report for The Intercept, Hidden Horrors of Zero Tolerance, Mass Trials and Children Taken from Their Parents. She's been on the ground reporting on what she calls zero-tolerance factories. Describe what you saw, Debbie. I've been to several of these trials. I've been in Brownsville, Laredo, and El Paso. And what you see is somewhere between 20 and 40 something people, all triple shackled, not to each other, but individually, um, their hands and handcuffs chained to their waists and their feet shackled. And they clunk and or clang into court. I mean, there's this clanging sound of chains. And they go through these mass processes um, in less than an hour, usually. And they um, often they, they are instructed to answer in groups or answer en masse. So you'll hear, like, 40 people being asked a question, and they'll say, see, sí, all at once, or they'll say, no. And it's, it's just un it's really uncanny. It's shocking. It doesn't feel like due process. One after one after one after one after one, with only one lawyer, they plead guilty. Culpable, 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 culpable. I mean, it's just—it it just feels like something out. I mean, the photo itself, added to the sounds, really makes you think of something like Abu Ghraib, except that it's completely legal in this country now to do this to people. It's just quite shocking to see. 
And, you know, very few people go to see it, um, which I think is another reason why it's happening on the border and with so little oversight. I've had trouble getting into courtrooms. Um, I go to get into the federal building, and I'm told, no, the judge said that the courtroom is too crowded, nobody can go in except for Border Patrol agents and lawyers, and I've had to argue to get in, even after I've said I was a reporter. So um, people don't see these, these proceedings, um, and people are afraid to argue, actually. So, the fact that this photo was taken is actually very remarkable. Um, the the uh, defense bar that I spoke with in that area, that's the Western District of Texas, said that they think that it was a marshal who took it. Somebody inside the court uh, secretly took it, probably. And my experience um, hanging around these courtrooms and talking to people and even having a little bit of whistleblower effect is that there are a lot of people inside these courtrooms or inside these courthouses who are not comfortable with what's going on. In fact, if you can, if we were able to continue to listen to the judge in that tape, he even starts to feel real anxiety, expresses anxiety about the fact that maybe it's not true that that people are being reunited well, in these uh, well, camps, Debbie, as he if calls we can, them, let's go, with uh, their children, uh, which is not true. Debbie, if we and can. he actually goes on to say to the uh, to the assistant U.S. attorney. If, if this is not true, if you're not reuniting these children, then we can imagine the hell that's being created. So the judge—I mean, there's so many people who are not comfortable with what's going on. Well, if we can, let's go to the audio recording you obtained from the Brownsville, Texas, courtroom of, a, of federal magistrate Judge Ronald Morgan, as he's presiding over the mass trials of these, uh, uh, of these fo folks who were apprehended at the border. This was in late April, and this begins with Judge Morgan offering another defendant the chance to address him before she was sentenced. Mr. Diaz-Castro, anything you'd like to say before sentence? <laughs> Same case as theirs. Uh, only they haven't separated me from my daughter, but they told me they were going to take her away. Well, let's hope they don't. You and your daughter, they should be joined together. Just ask, Mr. Andrew, my understanding is, is that where there is parent and child, the parent and child are supposed to be joined before they are separated and sent home. Is that correct? That's what I heard, Your Honor, as well. Tell you what, if it's not, then there are a lot of folks have some answering to do. Because what you've done, in effect, by separating these children, is you're putting them someplace without their parent. You can imagine there's a hell, and that's probably what it looks like. You best confirm that's the case. You best make sure that's the case. Yes, sir. Again, that was federal magistrate judge Ronald Morgan speaking in his Brownsville, Texas courtroom in late April uh, in this audio that Debbie uh, Nathan obtained for her report in, on the in, in the intercept. Uh, Debbie, this whole issue of uh, lawyers, one lawyer representing 30, 40, 50 people, obviously they can't have much in terms of uh, individual uh, uh, information about that particular person or what might have driven them to try to cross the border to begin with. Yeah, what I've heard is that um, they're getting somewhere between seven and ten minutes of counsel right before the proceedings. And, um, you know, I've talked to public defenders who try very, very hard to get information that would be helpful to the—I to the, um, was going to say client, but to the defendant, uh, for example, who really make an effort to find out whether they crossed with their children and whether they have a claim, a credible fear claim, that would allow them to later in the process. Um, claim asylum. But it seems so inconsistent. Like, I was in court in El Paso last week, and there were 60 defendants, and they were split into 20, into three groups of 20. And um, so each group of 20 had a lawyer. And I interviewed one lawyer who told me that of his 20, not one of them had been separated from a child, and not one of them had an asylum claim or a credible fear claim. So then, um, in the third group, I was able to interview the attorney 
who spoke Spanish, unlike uh, the first one, and seemed very, very concerned about the immigration issues. And he told me that of the 20 that I saw him representing, 10 of them had been separated from a total of 15 children, including one woman who was separated from three children. And, um, you know, he obtained that information by just really speaking with these people. So, you get the feeling that, you know, the, the um, legal representation, as, as short as it is, as few minutes as it is, also depends on whether the lawyers even care, you know, to find out what's going on. You know, in uh, also where you are, where you usually work in Brownsville, Oregon Democratic Senator Jeff Merkley was barred from entering a detention center, which was an old Walmart. Um, it's a detention center for immigrant children. Uh, just Sunday, after traveling to the center. Um, to see firsthand the Trump administration's practice of separating immigrant children from their parents, he tweeted, I was barred entry, asked repeatedly to speak to a supervisor. He finally came out and said he can't tell us anything. Police were called on us. Children should never be ripped from their families and held in secretive detention centers, he tweeted. <coughs> Federal authorities reportedly separating at least 600 immigrant children from their parents last month, sparking widespread outrage and international <coughs> condemnation. Even a U.S. senator is being escorted away by police, not allowed to go into the old Walmart where children are being held that we are paying for, Debbie. Yeah, I, I wasn't surprised. Um, it was, you know, sort of the same experience, only in spades, of what I've had when I've tried to go into court. It seems like Everybody is just being treated like some bum that knocks on the door, you know, like, what are you doing here? And, uh, you know, we're going to call the cops on you. I mean, it was, in a way, shocking to see him treated that way. I saw the video yesterday, but it wasn't surprising to me. Uh, Nobody De can get in there. Debbie, I want to turn to an interview you did with migrants you met. Uh, in, in Mexico, just across the border from El Paso. Uh, this clip uh, from a video you posted on Twitter this week and begins with you asking the migrants if they tried to cross the bridge to the United States at that uh, port of entry. Did you try to cross the bridge? Yes, we want to cross the bridge, but they do not allow us. What happened when you tried to cross? We want to seek help to enter the U.S. What's your name? My name is Chico. We want to enter the United States because we want to find a job. We have debts. We owe a lot because we are far from our country. What will happen to you if... Do you fear violence there? Yes, of course. If we do not pay our debts, the money we owe, they will threaten or kill us. Uh, so, Debbie, can you explain? These are the uh, the U.S. agents crossing. Are they crossing into Mexico before even the border crossings point uh, that the uh, the migrants would try to get through? So traditionally, you go to the port of entry to and you, which is this big building at the bottom. You know, now in Brownsville, it's a big curved bridge, and you go to the bottom of the bridge to the U.S. side to the port of entry, and you tell the agents that you want to request asylum, and that is your legal right. You're in the United States at that point, and you request asylum. So what's been happening up and down the border is—and this has been going on probably for at least a year and a half that I'm aware of, anyway—is that they're putting agents up at the top of the bridge, because, you know, there's sort of an invisible line, which is often marked with a plaque, but there's a line dividing the United States and Mexico. So they want — what the government wants at this point is for people not to be able to step into the United States at that invisible line, because they — then they can't apply for asylum. And so they've got these agents at the top of the bridge, and they're standing there, and they're asking everybody who they're suspicious about, you know, and suspicious of, of not, you know, of maybe they're going to apply for asylum, but asking people for their documents. And then they won't let people go into the United States. So, I mean, it's almost like they're not even in Mexico. Technically, they're in Mexico, but they're like six inches from the United States. And um, that's illegal. I mean, that's against American law and it's against international law. But that's what's happening up and down the border. And that's what I observed when I was in El Paso last week. And I interviewed um, those people who had been turned back. They'd already been turned back about three times and told, oh, come back, like, um, come back at 10 o'clock tonight or come back at 6 in the morning. We don't have room for you now. 
So they were camped out in front of a bathroom at the bottom of the bridge, which is the Mexico side. And, and you know, again, incredibly upsetting to see them really looking hungry and looking exhausted and weeping and telling me that they have multiple times tried to get in, get past these agents, and that they were not able to. Debbie Nathan, you also have a new report out for The Intercept that's headlined, Border Patrol Continues to Exaggerate Danger to Agents to Justify Violence Against Immigrants. Um, I want to ask you about this and how it relates to the Border Patrol officer who just shot dead, shot through the head, the 19-year-old indigenous Guatemalan woman, Claudia Gomez. Um, killing her. Uh, this in Rio Bravo, Texas. Video of the aftermath of the killing shows Border Patrol agents sealing off the scene and detaining at least two people. The agents first claim the officer fired in self-defense after officers were attacked by blunt objects. The family of Claudia Gomez-Gonzalez said she set off for a better life in the United States, despite what they had heard about tougher policies towards undocumented immigrants under Donald Trump. This is Gomez's mother, Lydia Gonzalez. I'm going to achieve something, she said. I'll earn money for my studies, she said. But unfortunately, she wasn't able to do that. Immigration killed my little girl, my little baby. No, no, no. She didn't go to steal. She's just gone, my baby. That's how it is. I just want justice for my girl, because it's not fair for them to do this. Now, if people are able to help me retrieve my baby's body as soon as possible, that's what I want. We can't do anything else now. She's dead. She's dead. So, Debbie Nathan, if you can talk about um, Border Patrol continuing to exaggerate the danger to agents to justify violence against immigrants, this horrific story about um, the shooting death of Claudia. Yeah. Um, a few months ago, I started uh, investigating the claims that Border Patrol has been making for about uh, the past several months, that it's a very dangerous job and that their assault statistics were way, way up from last year. And um, I got data from the Border Patrol, which showed that, in fact, uh, assaults were down and injuries are down. But they were using this accounting method. They were counting in this very strange, unconventional way. And, uh, for example, what I was told from law enforcement people is that, you know, police and law enforcement officials usually, like, if, if somebody's assaulted, that's considered one assault. I mean, somebody could throw seven rocks at you, and that would be—and you're one agent, so that's counted as one assault. But the Border Patrol was—or was, still is, I guess multiplying the number of agents assaulted. And, by the way, an assault doesn't necessarily cause an injury. And in most cases, with the Border Patrol, it doesn't. But multiplying the number of agents assaulted by the number of perpetrators and the number of weapons. So the example that they gave me was six agents assaulted by seven perpetrators who used a water bottle, a rock, and a tree branch. So when you multiply and multiply and multiply, you get 126 assaults. Conventionally, that would be counted as six assaults. And remember that, actually, the um, spokesperson did not respond when I asked if any of the agents had been hurt. So what I found out, as I continued and did the second report, was that injuries are down, according to other methods that you can look at, objective methods to look at injuries um, in the Border Patrol. And um, the way that this relates to the young woman who was killed is that um, she was actually killed about a mile from a case that I'm aware of, where a very tiny Guatemalan, who looks to me like he was a teenager, was uh, running from Border Patrol agents, I guess in the same way that, that the woman in this group was running a year later. Um, he was running, and um, there was a melee that ensued in which he was accused of assaulting an, a Border Patrol agent. But he elected to go to trial, or he was put on trial, and he was acquitted. And um, it was explained to me by the uh, public defenders in the Southern District that their assumption was that the jury just took a look at the size difference between these two people. The agent was this pretty big, burly guy, and the, um, the uh, immigrant looked like a little pencil. I mean, he was just this tiny, frail. He probably weighed 100 pounds, and the agent probably weighed at least 160. So they just figured that—plus, oh, oh, the immigrant had blood on his ear. His ear was all banged up. 
and the um, agent had, um, I think, like a sprained elbow. So he was acquitted. But what was interesting to me was that that will go into that incident, whatever it was about and for which he was acquitted, will go into the statistics as an assault. And what's also very telling to me is that if you listen to the Border Patrol sort of talking to itself, the Border Patrol Council, which is their union, has a podcast, which is sponsored by Breitbart, where the hosts sit there and they, they talk about, you know, they're very anti-immigrant and um, very sort of um, feeling sorry for themselves. There's one particular podcast that anybody can listen to where they say, you know, we've just had enough of these assaults and we should be allowed to um, respond. We should be allowed to use more force and um, we should be allowed to— Mm -hmm. And we should basically be allowed to beat people up. That's what they say. Debbie Nathan, we want to thank you for being with us. Thank you for all your work on the border, as you work from Brownsville, Texas, on the Mexico border. We'll link to your pieces in The Intercept, Hidden Horrors of Zero Tolerance, Mass Trials and Children Taken from the Parents, as well as the piece you just did, Border Patrol Continues to Exaggerate Danger to Agents to Justify Violence Against Immigrants. When we come back, the Supreme Court ruling in favor of a Colorado baker who refused to bake a wedding cake for a gay couple, citing his religious opposition. Stay with us.